I've already said this twice before, but it bears repeating. 2012 was an absolutely fantastic year for movies. So much so that when I started making this list, I couldn't possibly narrow it down to just 10. So, I decided to do a top 15. Now obviously, I haven't seen every movie that came out this year, a brief list of which will be in the description. So, without further ado, it's finally time for me to shut up about movies for a while and unveil to you my absolute favorite films of 2012. Number 15, The Avengers. What? The Avengers is only number 15? Blasphemy! Oh, shut up. I love the Avengers a great deal, and you know you have at least a somewhat interesting list when one of the biggest, most successful movies in history just barely makes it. The thing is, everyone and their mother has already talked about the Avengers in great detail and praised it to no end. So I won't spend a lot of time here talking about it because odds are you've seen it for yourself. I will say though that it was the best movie it needed to be. A good old fashioned superhero movie. Like Captain America before it, the Avengers goes against the flow of dark and brooding comic book movies that are becoming increasingly oversaturated and just celebrates why we enjoy superheroes in the first place. A sinister villain with a plot to take over the world. Sorry, I'm not stealing from the nostalgia critic this time. An unlikely group of people with extraordinary abilities that are already strong alone but are unstoppable together, culminating in an epic showdown in a big city with lots of chaos, explosion, and skyscrapers falling apart. The Avengers did the best job putting that on the big screen. It's not deep, philosophical, or profound, but it doesn't need to be. It's a solidly entertaining blockbuster with clever and snappy dialogue, good performances, especially from Mark Ruffalo and the always great Robert Downey Jr., fantastic action set pieces, and quite the sense of humor. While it may not be my favorite superhero movie of all time, that would be Spider-Man 2, I still thoroughly enjoyed it. Joss Whedon, thank you. Number 14, End of Watch. You know what the funny thing is? I forgot about this movie when writing the top five most surprisingly good movies of 2012. Because if I didn't, End of Watch would have definitely been on that list as well as this one. At first glance, it doesn't seem to be anything unique or engaging. It looked like a found footage buddy cop drama, and you'd be mostly right. It is a buddy cop drama, but it's not all found footage. But what really makes End of Watch stand out is the writing, the dialogue and the conversations in the relationship between the two main characters. My assumption was dead fucking wrong, and I'm glad because of it. It is very much engaging and it'll keep you drawn in all throughout the film. It's a very emotionally powerful movie and it made me care very deeply for the two cops and their almost brotherly bond. The chemistry between Jake Gyllenhaal and Michael Pinay is simply incredible and the performances and dedication to each other, both in and out of character, are without a doubt the best part of the film. End of Watch doesn't really break new ground in the cop drama genre, but with its stellar writing and phenomenal acting, it makes something familiar fresh again. So, if I convinced you to go check it out for yourself, hey, it just came out on Blu-ray, so pick that shit up. Number 13, 21 Jump Street. If you've seen the top five most surprisingly good movies of 2012, then you already know how 21 Jump Street completely blew me away by how hilarious it turned out to be so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail for this video. What you do need to know is that it makes the brilliant decision to poke fun at reboots and remakes while also kind of being self-aware of the fact that it's a reboot itself. It's a universally humorous film with jokes of all forms to get a laugh from everyone with different tastes in comedy. The performances are just hilarious, including a surprising turn from Channing Tatum. Didn't see that coming. Still think he sucks though. Honestly, there's really nothing else I can say about 21 Jump Street. If I had to sum it all up in one word, that word would be hysterical. But don't take it from me. Watch it for yourself. You'll be glad you did. Number 12, Flight. I love Robert Zemeckis. Back to the Future, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Forrest Gump. All classics, all incredible, all I consider to be my favorites. But then he went through a phase where he made nothing but motion capture CG animated movies. I honestly haven't either seen them all in their entirety, or I didn't see them at all. 
They just didn't seem that interesting to me. But I suppose, thanks to the titanic failure that was Mars Needs Moms, Zemeckis decided to return to live-action films. And he came back with a vengeance. Flight wasn't like the lofty, light-hearted Zemeckis films we associate him with. It was his first R-rated movie in decades, and quickly lets us know that by showing tits, drinking, saying fuck, and snorting some cocaine, all in the very first scene. Wow. But anyway, Flight certainly wasn't what I expected, but that's a good thing. The story was more of a character piece than about the crash itself. We spend most of the time watching Denzel Washington sink lower and lower into a drunken hole he can't dig himself out of. This isn't a character you can really stand behind. You can't decide whether or not you want him to get his job back or get some help. You're genuinely concerned for this person. That's when you know an actor has done his job in the best fucking way possible. By having you feel for someone and wish that person the best, even though their destiny is preordained. Denzel Washington isn't the only one who shines with this performance. It's terrifically acted all over with Don Cheadle, Kelly Riley, and a hilarious turn from John Goodman with the brief time that he was given. Now there are times where you think Washington would have learned his lesson by now, and there are moments in the film where it gets a little preachy. One could interpret that it's just a giant advertisement for Alcoholics Anonymous. But if great acting and compelling drama is your thing, you can't really go wrong with flight. Here's hoping Zemeckis never goes back to mocap. Number 11, Lincoln. I was excited for Lincoln even when Liam Neeson was still supposed to star in it. Partly because Steven Spielberg was directing it, but also, come on. Who wouldn't want to see a biopic about one of the most important people who ever lived? When it finally came out, it wasn't the Abraham Lincoln movie I had playing in my head. I thought it would have been just the traditional retrospective chronicling Lincoln's life, but nope. They just cut out all the filler and focused exclusively on the thing that he was remembered for, ending slavery, and the hell that he and his cabinet had to go through to get it done. It should go without saying that it was really interesting to see all that unfold and compare it to the politics of today on how much has changed and how much hasn't. It's essentially a sequel to the movie Amistad, kind of fitting seeing how Spielberg directed both films, both concerned differing subjects regarding slavery, both had presidents playing a major role, and both films were grounded in realism and focused on the performances and dialogue, differing from the blockbuster fantasy and escapism we typically associate with Spielberg, which really shows how he can be a great and diverse filmmaker as a whole. Despite the entire plot being delivered almost entirely through the dialogue, to me there wasn't really a dull moment. I personally welcomed all the talking. It gave me a chance to study and observe the way they spoke and enunciated things back in the day. I found it rather intriguing. I also like how the lighting and camera work conformed to Lincoln's character. Calm, mellow, and timid. It was a very nice touch. But I'm droning on about the more minute aspects of the film and not talking about what matters most in movies like this. The acting. An overwhelming majority of people have given the performances in Lincoln outstanding praise and accolades to the highest degree. And you know what? They're right! Academy, don't delay the inevitable. Just go ahead and give Daniel Day-Lewis the Oscar for Best Actor. We all know he's going to win. He fucking deserves it. Every time he speaks, especially during one of his stories or monologue, you'd behave in the same way as if you were listening to the actual Lincoln. You shut the hell up and listen! There's just something about Lewis's delivery that makes you hang on to his every word. I didn't know how to picture or interpret Abraham Lincoln, the person, not the icon, until Lewis did it for me. The same thing can be said for Sally Field and Tommy Lee Jones. They were just as fantastic. I could go on with the rest of the surprisingly prestigious cast, but then we'd be here for days. Lincoln probably won't hit with everyone with its talk-heavy political themes, but if you're interested in seeing a big-budget history lesson, then look no further. It's truly a treat for the ones who are interested in the performance elite, and it's Spielberg's best movie in years. Number 10. Chronicle. Nowadays, a lot of people bitch and complain about there being too many found footage movies and too many superhero movies. But then a movie like Chronicle comes along and takes elements of both genres and miraculously making the best examples out of both of them. 
This was another film that I overlooked making the most surprisingly good movies list. God damn it! I'm really slipping up here. Anyway, you guys all know the gist by now. I thought it was going to suck, it got good reviews, yada yada yada, I ended up loving it. I love movies like these. Low budget, high imagination, and Chronicle certainly has that. Technical limits are no excuse not to have a good story and characters, and the movie shines in that area as well. Despite it being a found footage superhero movie, Chronicle's story has kind of a Shakespearean tone to it, and a tragic one at that. Rise and fall plots have been done time and time again, but the brilliant use of the found footage motif made it feel more personal, and in turn, more effective. A story is only as good as its characters, and though the cast was relatively small and the roles were a bit cliched, the actors here do extremely well with what they're given. Especially Dane DeHaan, I, I can certainly see him going places. Chronicle is a short movie, less than 90 minutes long, but more happens here than a lot of other films twice its length. It's a complete and satisfying experience that brings a breath of fresh air to familiar and tired genres. It's definitely worth your time, so if you haven't seen it, go check it out. Number 9. The Cabin in the Woods I've already gone into a good bit of detail about The Cabin in the Woods, but to those who missed that, here's a quick recap. I thought it was going to be a by-the-book shitty horror movie when in fact, it parodies the genre but also pays tribute to it. It's cleverly written with great dialogue and smart characters who are pretty much forced into their archetypical roles beyond their control. Still a great twist, by the way. It's incredibly funny and has some legitimately scary moments thrown into the mix as well. And this, along with the Avengers, made me into a fan of Joss Whedon. I've spent too much time already praising this movie. Just go see it for yourself. So, once again, if you consider this a horror movie, then it's the best horror movie I've seen in years. Number 8. Skyfall. I have to admit something to you guys. I am not well versed in the James Bond filmography. I've only seen a handful of the movies, mainly the ones with Pierce Brosnan and Daniel Craig, so I may not be qualified to judge Skyfall in comparison to the classic Bond movies, but nonetheless, I still thought it was fucking awesome even on its own merits. At first I was skeptical about Sam Mendes taking over the directing spot for Skyfall. Don't get me wrong, I love Mendes's work, but I only knew him as someone who made visually striking dramas, not action blockbusters. Those fears were put to rest the first time I saw the trailer. My anticipation skyrocketed, and I'm glad to say it lived up to my expectations. My favorite part of it was actually the story and how much more personal the conflict is compared to the other Bond films I've seen. It's simple but effective, and it does a great job at introducing plot elements and then promptly utilizing them later on. The action scenes were just incredible to look at and experience so cleanly and clearly. Kudos to cinematographer Roger Deakins for that. Out of the three times Daniel Craig has played Bond, this is definitely my favorite of his performances. I think he's found the perfect balance of being the suave and sophisticated pussy magnet and the total badass that people usually expect from James Bond but can't really seem to find in some of the other people who've played them. Javier Bardem does what he does best, being a creepy ass villain who you wouldn't want to fuck with unless, unless you're, well, James fucking Bond, of course. What else can I say? This is my favorite Bond film out of the few that I've seen, which really means I need to tighten up and watch the classics. But back to the subject, it's exhilarating, it draws you in, it's the best action movie of the year. Number 7. Seven Psychopaths. This movie definitely sparked my interest, but I really had no idea what it was going to be about. Something about kidnapping a shih tzu or something. While it did involve that particular story, it doesn't paint the complete picture. There are multiple stories that pop in and out during Seven Psychopaths, and they're all great in my opinion, and really it wasn't what I expected, or what anyone else expected for that matter since the movie's marketing campaign was very misleading. It's violent, it's funny, it's shocking, the stories within the story are just wonderful, the writing is fantastic, it's just an extremely satisfying and well-rounded work of cinema. If there's only one complaint I have about this film, and it's a relatively minor one at that, it's that the actors don't really step out of their comfort zones. They're what you'd expect from them. Colin Farrell is an alcoholic Irishman, Sam Rockwell and Woody Harrelson are eccentric nutjobs, and Christopher Walken is... well, Christopher Walken. 
in this case, that's not really a bad thing. They stick to their guns and do a good job of what they're given. Another thing I'd like to mention is that the film is a tad bit misogynistic, but the movie is so good in other aspects that it didn't really bother me that much. So, if you like funny, finely crime movies, you can't go wrong with Seven Psychopaths. Number 6. Beasts of the Southern Wild There comes a time when a film is able to carry both a solid, cohesive narrative as well as a graceful, artistic feel with it as well. Just having seen Beasts of the Southern Wild, it's still fresh on my mind. I'm still taking in the moving tale of life, loss, discovery, and the tumultuous bond between a father and his young daughter. The imaginative nuances and creative solutions to the film apply to its tight budget, its amazing and surreal special effects, the incredible musical score that ranges from being upbeat and jubilant to somber and emotional. The raw but effective camera work, where its unwillingness to be still actually accentuates the mood and behavior of the people and places there, and not just doing it to be cool. The absolutely wonderful performance from its young star. It's really hard to find good child actors these days, but this little girl, god damn was she terrific. It's a beautiful film that exemplifies the enjoyment of the simple things, the endearing trials of a rural lifestyle, the desire to leave your stamp on the universe, and the abstract expression of facing your fear and challenging it head on, uncertain and scared of what's to come, but still being strong, resilient, and prepared for whatever life throws at you. Beasts of the Southern Wild will make you think and immerse you in its flamboyant Cajun whimsy. It's low-budget, imaginative filmmaking at its finest, and I humbly suggest you experience it for yourself. Number 5. Safety Not Guaranteed Sometimes I don't feel like watching something loud and bombastic, either in action or comedy. Sometimes I just want a film down-to-earth, quirky, and interesting with a cool concept and clever writing. Safety Not Guaranteed is that kind of movie. It had me aching to see it the moment I saw the trailer. And when I finally watched it, I just couldn't help but have a big smile on my face. It's rare for a movie to meet the high expectations you set for it and still throw you a curveball and catch you off guard. But it can happen, and it's a great feeling. I really don't want to talk too much about the story, not in fear of giving anything important away, but because I want you to experience it the same way I did, being pleasantly surprised by the outcome. Trust me, if you watch it, you'll thank me later because the film is definitely worth your time, especially with the characters and the people who play them. They're all wonderfully performed, with a standout work from Aubrey Plaza. I'd like to go on an adventure with her any day, if you know what I mean. Hey, I can't help it, she's fucking beautiful. Don't let this get awkward now. I'm being totally dead fucking serious. Go to your local Redbox and give this movie a watch. It's funny, it's endearing, it's a great story that's more than meets the eye, and it has one of the best endings I've seen in a movie all year. It's guaranteed to make you smile. Hey, no pun intended. Hipsters and indie snobs usually go gaga over these types of quirky Juno-esque films, but if there are more movies that measure up to the quality of safety not guaranteed, well then who the hell can blame them?